So um, this is the first um, update session for EBA program, uh, which is a new initiative that we're trying to roll out to our customers, uh, making sure that um, they are they get up to speed to what's been happening um, with the developments in terms of content, uh, partners, and systems and support, etc. Um, so um, there's some housekeeping rules. Uh, you may have noticed that um, your videos and um, your audio has been turned off. Um, so I appreciate if any questions that you have throughout um, the presentations to just um, put it in the chat box and then um, in the chat box and then uh, we will attend to them uh, after our presentations. Um, the recordings will be sent to you uh, in an email after uh, the session and as well as the PowerPoints that has been presented. And our contact details will also be included. So you may contact us at any point of time if you have any more questions after the session. Um, so with that, I'll pass on to our sales director for APEC uh, to do the updates for the session. Stephen? Thank you uh, and good morning, everyone. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay, so once again, thank you very much for joining us uh, this morning. And I would like to share some uh, important updates about our EBA program. Uh, some of you may already heard about the uh, upcoming uh, the embargo that uh, we have to introduce. These are uh, uh, requested by the uh, university press, uh, particularly the uh, university presses. So there are some publishers uh, which are not uh, having this embargo. So for example, Detroiter and quite a number of our uh, other non-university press uh, partners, they will not introduce any embargo. I will give some uh, explanation on the reason why uh, the university press uh, introduced this uh, embargo. And in fact, we are probably one of the last one introducing this uh, the front list embargo. Uh, many of the aggregators uh, last year uh, or even before already started. So we are one of the last few, uh, the last publishers, uh, vendor that is uh, introducing this uh, embargo. Right, so let me give you an uh, overall update on our content. Then I'll go into the reason of uh, this embargo. And uh, all right, so, just a quick overview. Uh, what we feel that uh, this EBA program uh, we are introducing, it helps the library to uh, have a better control of our ebooks acquisition, right? But while enabling our users to participate in the library's uh, collection development. Why do I say that? Because uh, from the usage uh, data, uh, we are seeing some libraries uh, around the world in Asia Pac. Uh, librarians are using this data to determine what are the collections or publisher subjects that uh, you would like to uh, buy in, in package or collection, right? To help the library uh, collection development strategy and policy, right? So this is what we've been seeing uh, in many parts of the world, especially in Asia, Pac, I, we see there is a trend uh, and we are moving towards more uh, introducing uh, data support for our clients. So we even change uh, our uh, way of uh, our workflow, our process. Uh, we bring in new skill, new people to help us to run those data on behalf of our uh, librarians in order for them to uh, get a better insight on the behavior of the uh, users to help them determine what they should be uh, buying in case there is any uh, year end budget or throughout the year, uh, whether they want to buy a single title from aggregator or they can decide to buy from a uh, decroiter if a particular university press or publishers that uh, contribute a high volume of the usages. Okay. So on this slides, 
what I want to uh, illustrate is that uh, our content growth right over the last uh, six years, you can see that it's on a high uh, double digit growth in content. Overall, this slide shows you the blue one are the non-English uh, language comprised of uh, many other language, German, French, uh, Spanish. Uh, then what we focus more in our, this part of the world is the blue color bar, right? So the blue color bar, our number of uh, titles growth over the years has also increased, right? Maybe let me move on to the next slides to look at the uh, English uh, language content. Uh, before that, on this slide, I just want to illustrate uh, the EBA value, right? And the number of titles. So since 2014 up to 2022, our titles growth has started from 20,000 titles to now about more than 140,000, right? In 2023 this year, we see that uh, our total eBooks on our platform, all languages, is now about more than uh, 140,000 titles. And the value up to uh, 2022 is worth about uh, 15 million. But uh, when I look at the latest data in uh, 2023, all these 142,000 odd titles, the total value is about 21 million now. But over the years, uh, we can see those uh, existing customers that has been reversed for uh, almost six years your price have been very stable, right? Even if there's any price increase, uh, it's at uh, 2%. And even during pandemic, we have uh, also hold our price uh, in, in almost uh, every market, right? So this slide here is to illustrate the value that you are getting when uh, you are on our EBA program. So the next one I want to show that uh, this English content growth. And on the last bar, I will speak a bit more about this embargo and what is the impact, right? So if you look at the English content since 2018 to 2023 this year, so I look at year on year growth as at January each year. Again, the English content is growing at a high double digit, right? So at least we experience a 20% increase in number of titles, new titles, new copyright year, and some of it are the, uh, uh, the backlist, which, uh, for example, Princeton University Press, they've been working with us uh, for a long time. And over the years, they've been giving us uh, more titles, not only the front list, but some of the backlist, some of the, uh, the rare collections they are giving it uh, to us to upload onto our platform. So this 20 over percent growth in content comprise of new copyright year and uh, also the uh, backlist. And Princeton University Press probably has almost 99% of the content all with the Kreuter. So we, we are one of the publisher that, uh, uh, or you can call us a uh, kind of like a university press aggregator. Uh, we are probably one of the most comprehensive vendor that holds most of the university press content, right? So uh, with universe, uh, with like Princeton University, they gave us uh, almost 99% of what they have on their content, right? And when we look at the uh, usages of those uh, top five university press uh, or top five publisher in most of our uh, libraries uh, usage uh, stat statistics, uh, De Kreuter, Princeton usually will be in the top five uh, in terms of the usage, right? So let's look at this uh, last bar here compared to the, uh, the second last bar uh, in light green. So up to January 2023, right, we have about 82,000 uh, content, right, on our platform in English language, 82,000. So that is about, uh, it represents a 28% growth over 2022. And the last bar here, I have uh, removed the titles. Uh, so the embargo will start in 2024, January. So 2024, 2022, and 
2023 and 2022, so three copyright year content, right, will not be available, the front list from a list of university press, which I'll share with you the, uh, the following screen. Uh, so if I compare in terms of the content uh, up to January 2023 and June 2023, there's about uh, a difference of 2,000 over titles. Right. So if uh, titles without embargo up to 2021 copyright year total, we have about 82,000 titles here uh, with the embargo uh, up to copyright 2021, we have about 80,000 titles. So the difference is about 4% uh, or so, but still we are seeing a, a content growth uh, from 2022 to 2023 at 24%, right? So I guess there will be questions on this. I'll take the questions uh, towards the end of the uh, my presentation, right? So uh, do uh, ask me question about this and I'm happy to explain, right? So what are the reasons for the uh, EBA embargo? Right? The embargo is mainly on the EBA. Uh, and in fact, for aggregator, the DDA, EBA, uh, they all have embargo. Right? And it started much earlier uh, than uh, the Reuters. We are probably the last publisher that introduced this uh, uh, embargo starting from 2024, January. Right? So what are the reasons for some of this embargo? So, as many of you uh, would know that uh, the university press, because many of your university may also have a university press. The university press typically are funded by the, their parent uh, university. Other than uh, up to about maybe 15, 20 years, 15, 20 years ago, uh, like University of Cambridge University Press and Oxford University Press, uh, the parent university no longer fund them. They have to be more commercial thinking uh, and from the profit, they have to uh, return to the university to continue their uh, not-for-profit uh, mission in education. But most of the university press uh, in the world, right, especially a large part of the university press comes from the America, they are all majority, almost all are funded by the, uh, their university. Without this funding, they are not able to sustain. Right. Why is that so? Because uh, the university press typically the the content um many scholarly content and it doesn't sell at high quantity, right? Typically, a title a, a book that is published uh, a monograph nowadays uh, average they will probably sell about hundred not more than two hundred copies around the world, right? So when there is, it used to be much higher, maybe about four to 500 copies uh, 40 years ago, but uh, for the number of titles has uh, reduced. So on average, it's about 100 to 200 copies uh, at most. And so this scholarly content, commercial publisher normally would not uh, take on because it doesn't generate a high uh, revenue and profit but for the university press, they are mission driven, right? They are mission driven about uh, the scholarly content. And with this embargo, because they think about the sustainability concern, right? So they remove the front list. They hope that the front list uh, will be able to generate uh, enough quantity revenue to support the, uh, the sustainability. And why uh, the last point here, I said, uh, usage not necessarily converted into sales because from EBA uh, or even when the participation in DDA, they participate, uh, especially EBA titles, there's a usage. The usage that we have seen uh, around the world and especially uh, within Asia Pacific region, it's at least uh, almost five minimum. It's about eight times the commitment. That means, for example, if a uh, commitment of uh, 20,000, for example, they get to access 80,000 content, the titles being downloaded, the value typically is uh, the return on investment is 10 times to up to even uh, 50 times return. 
That means the usage of uh, content can be as high as uh, half a million euro, even though the commitment is about, let's say, 20,000 or 30,000. But there's a good usage. It not necessarily generate into sales for the university press. So because based on the commitment amount, uh, let's say 20, uh, 20,000 euro, typically average about 100 euro per title, uh, university library typically will be able to select up to 200 titles. But the usage is as high as five to 10,000 titles being used. So many titles have been used, but has not been selected, converted into sales for the uh, university press and the partners. So this is one of the major concern also. Uh, when they participate in uh, uh, EBA, right? It gives good value for our patron, but from the publisher, uh, the university press point of view, they find that uh, it's not uh, generating uh, revenue to support their sustainability uh, concern, right? So these are the four main uh, reasons that uh, university press, uh, why they would think about uh, embargo. So let me list, uh, show you this uh, list of uh, publishers that do not have embargo first, right? So the Reuter and our imprint does not have any embargo, right? So we have like Berkhauser, which focus on uh, architecture. Uh, some are brands like the Mouton, which is the top linguistic uh, publisher. They are probably the world top three publisher after like uh, Cambridge and Princeton. Uh, like KG Sauer is in there. There's no embargo. And uh, KG Sauer uh, used to be known as KG Sauer. Detroit Sauer uh, focus on library science. Uh, we publish for IFLA. And the last couple of uh, publisher uh, like uh, Dosh, uh, Kunzvalat, uh, it's also architecture, Jovis, right? This, this list of a publisher, including the Reuter imprint does not have embargo. So the second slide here I, I will show is there are 12 publisher, uh, including uh, a couple of uh, university press, uh, University of Hawaii, uh, Amsterdam University Press. Uh, they do not uh, also participate in any embargo. So this does not have embargo. New front list will still be added, right? So the following slides I want to show you, these are the ones that uh, has embargo starting from 2024, right? Majority are university press, except uh, there are two non-university press, right? Bertrand and uh, Lynn Rhino, right? Uh, the rest would have uh, embargo. And so all in all, there are... Uh, 18 university press and publisher that has an embargo, okay? Uh, but the last three are listed separately, 16 to 18, uh, University of California, Yale, Duke, University Press. Uh, though they have embargo, these are packages that add on separately. So the full English content uh, would not uh, automatically added these three university press. So they have a separate arrangement where we can add them into our EBA program, but they have to be uh, a separate add-on package uh, uh, pricing. So let me go into the revised embargo pricing. So these are probably one of the uh, your, uh, concern other than what are titles, which publishers, copyright that has embargo, the pricing. So for the non-consortial uh, customers, right, uh, there are three things that uh, you want to take note. Customers that uh, are going into the renewal price. So uh, some of, uh, many of our customers are going into renewal this year for the non-consortial members. Uh, we will adjust the price of a reduction of 20%, right? This to take into the embargo uh, into consideration. Right, for our existing customers. For new customers, uh, we have already adjusted the pricing. Right? Then at the title selection stage, after 12 months, uh, some of you are going into uh, title selection in this year, uh, particularly in the second half of this year. Uh, we, have a, we have introduced a, a new uh, policy to allow a 20% discount of the list price 
for the current period, the existing customers, right? So for new customers, when you join this year, your price has been adjusted, right? With the embargo in mind. And in, when up to the 12 month uh, period, you will also enjoy that uh, the new customers and also our existing customers will get to enjoy the 20% discount of the list price. Right. So this is something new that we are introducing uh, with this embargo. And for the uh, consortium members, your price have been, uh, in fact, uh, specially arranged because we have a criteria of a number of a, a university join. You will enjoy a certain uh, pricing. And thus, uh, your offer, the offer that we uh, provide, you get to enjoy 20% discount of the list price uh, during the title selection stage. Oh. This applies to the new and existing customers. The same arrangement for our uh, non-consortia -consor customers, right? So uh, maybe there's too much information to take in, no worries. We'll share these slides with you. And if you have any uh, doubt, uh, we'll answer later, or you can follow up with our, uh, our account manager and our agents, they will be able to uh, uh, help you and explain to you how uh, it, this will affect you and how your new pricing will be, uh, how it looks like. Right, so uh, the non-EBA publishers, I just want to list some of the non-EBA uh, uh, publishers. So these are some of the non-EBA uh, publisher uh, that we are representing. So uh, university press and non-university press. And there's another new update is that uh, we have 17 uh, university press from the Association of Canadian University Presses that has joined the Croiter program. They are not on our EBA, except the uh, University of Toronto Press uh, is already in the EBA, EBA, but with uh, embargo, right? So these are the uh, latest uh, university presses that are joining us uh, in terms of uh, wanting De Gruyter to represent them uh, around the world, right? So for the non-EBA customers and this uh, group of uh, university presses, uh, we are able to uh, offer this uh, solution. I mean, this also include uh, embargo customers because what happened to the front list, right? So a front list, front list purchase of uh, embargo and non-embargo publishers, you can actually purchase single title through Gobi, ProQuest, or with our agents, or with uh, DeGroyter directly, right? You can do pick and choose, single title purchase, or the access, whether you buy single title through the this aggregator, or through our agent, or directly reverse, the access will be through our uh, award-winning platform, right? And there are also other uh, uh, acquisition, uh, method by subject collections or by publisher collections. And when you're buying multiple uh, collections, uh, we have tier discount, right? So the subject or uh, publisher collection itself would have a discount. And if you buy more collection, you have additional discount. So discount after discount, right? Again, uh, talk to our uh, our sales team or our uh, agents, they will be able to uh, provide you uh, an overview and an offer of how it looks like. If you do see that the usage are particularly uh, high from a particular publisher, this might be a, a good uh, consideration because uh, it does give you a lot of uh, savings. The last few slides uh, quickly, I just want to show you again, you will have a copy of this uh, PowerPoint. So these are some of the technical uh, details on our EBA, right? Uh, so I'm not gonna go into the details of it. So we'll be able to provide you all these services. Right, thank you. I'll pass on to uh, Lavinia to uh, give you an update on how uh, we can onboard and even existing customers, if you need any help from our team, uh, we'll be more than happy to uh, support you in, in any way we can. Lavinia, over to you. Okay, thank you. I'm just going to share my slides, which you should be able to see. 
Um, so yes. um, in the next few minutes, I'll be sharing quickly on the services and support that we have been providing our existing customers, EBA and non-EBA, and you're entitled and you have the rights to request uh, for them from us. Um, so let's just run through the slides. Um, so as a start, uh, we think that it's quite important uh, to make sure that our um, new customers and existing customers get uh, familiarized with what they're actually acquiring. Um, so uh, with this session today, we are kickstarting a series where um, even at an ad hoc basis, you can request from us to provide an overview of uh, what's been happening with the EBA content developments, as well as um, highlights that you know, um, your library team should be aware of or be aware of so that you know, they can disseminate this knowledge uh, to the users. We also have um, launched a couple of useful systems, which you might have heard of. We have worked with um, LibLinks, IP Registry, and we have also started a DG data portal where libraries are able to self-help themselves to reports, holdings, um, and et cetera, um, at any point of time that they like uh, through a debreuter.com um, account. Um, there is also a regular communication schedule that we have started a couple of years ago. So all EBA customers will receive um, two newsletters from the marketing team, uh, which will showcase uh, what has been um, changed um, in the past um, six months. Um, so on the right, uh, you might be familiar with the recent uh, newsletters that's been circulated with a video of a snapshot of what's been happening at the Reuter. Um, You can also request um, reports uh, frequencies to your liking or at any point of time where you feel like you need to have a look at the usages um, and the trends that, um, you know, how the content has been accessed. And in the last slide, I will also share with you the support team uh, within APEC that you will be able to contact um, at any point of time for any issues that you might have with the program. Um, next is uh, communications. Where needed, uh, we have provided a series of um, standardized banners that you may use uh, for your websites or your communications with the faculties when you acquire uh, content. We also provide customized messaging to your users depending on your need. Is it to promote to a certain faculties or for a particular subject? So this helps to you know, set expectations within your users as to what exactly they're entitled uh, to you know, view and access. We can also work with library teams to create customized uh, content across different uh, formats that you feel best suited to your audience. Uh, Engagement-wise, we have been collaborating with a few institutions um, to run some online and offline sessions uh, for students which might be in a place of, you know, how to get published workshops, how to use thegrider.com so we found tips and tricks uh, to search for content. We do interactive activities uh, to reward students uh, as a form of learning. And at the end of all these activity status, we also make it a point to always have a feedback uh, for all the users so that this will also be shared with the library teams as to, you know, how effective they are. Um, so I'm sharing just a few examples. Um, on the left, sorry, it's in Mandarin, uh, but these are all customized um, activities that we did with specific institutions. Um, so on the left is some quizzes that we run with two institutions. Um, and then on the right is a publishing workshops that we run with ECU. And I just want to highlight that we also make it a point to work with authors um, that is based within your institutions to come in and share their experience with the users, which we think that has more credibility than just, you know, editorial speaking. Um, lastly, these are just feedbacks, which I'm just going to leave on the screen. Um, and I just want to point out that if, uh, in any case that you're in need of, you know, um, some help, um, these are the two part of context which you can familiarize yourself with. We have Peggy uh, within uh, APEC that helps to address, you know, uh, content issues, holdings, uh, running reports, invoicing, and et cetera. And for myself, I cover the library marketing. So uh, please come to me uh, if you want to know more about, you know, uh, content promotions, uh, materials, training, or engagements with the users. Um, so that's the short wrap up from me.
And we can now move on to, um, to the uh, Q&A session. So basically, you can welcome to ask us anything via the chat box. Right. So we'll give a couple of minutes um, for people who might have a questions to type in the chat box. Uh, but if not, this is really just a um, short session um, that is aimed to help to uh, our customers to be up to date with uh, the EBA developments, as well as you know, um, forthcoming um, ideas that you know we can collaborate with in terms of the marketing needs. Okay. So far, there's no questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so oh, any, there, we uh, there we go. Okay. We have one uh, from Monica. I think it will be a question for you. Um, so I'm just going to read it out um, to the audience. Um, so we just mentioned that the embargo would be employed for some university presses titles published from 2021. As we purchased quite a number of university presses titles from 2021 to 2023, so does it mean that uh, we are not able to assess those titles from 2024 onwards? Uh, uh, no, this does not uh, affect those uh, single title purchase subject or collection that's, that you're buying outside of the, uh, the EBA program. So it's only within the EBA program uh, in 2024, uh, the content, the copyright year for 2024, 2023, 2022. So the three copyright year, uh, you will not be able to see them in within the EBA, right? So in 2025, it will be 2025, 2024, uh, 2023 copyright year, uh, you will not be able to see. So every year it will keep on overlap. And like uh, beginning of next year, uh, within the EBA, those uh, uh, university press that uh, or publisher that introduce uh, embargo, you will only see their content up to 2021 within EBA. Then in 2025, you'll see their content up to 2022. So they will keep on uh, adding uh, the, the year. They have three years embargo. But those uh, titles that you bought uh, through ProQuest or Gobi or directly from a single title purchase, uh, or you have purchased a front list package collection, it's not been affected, right? So as I mentioned, the uh, university press concern is uh, there are quite, uh, the top five publisher will usually get chosen when it comes to uh, usage to conversion uh, into the perpetual access. But there are many other uh, university press, their title have been use but it has never generated any sales for them so that's the reason why they introduced this embargo within the eba but you can still continue to buy those front list titles right uh, 2022 2023 or even 2024 next year uh, not affecting not it's not been affected by this embargo right for subject collection uh, publisher collections and a uh, single title purchase. It's not affected by the embargo. Um, so she's continued the conversation and say in this connection for those university presses, there is no so-called front list EBA anymore. Yes, so those uh, publisher and university press that introduce embargo uh, from January 2024, their so-called front list uh, will not be uh, available within EBA, right? So from 2022 onwards next year, but then 2025, it's from 2023 onwards, the titles are, will not be available. The previous copyright year that has been embargoed in 2022 will be added on to uh, the EBA eventually. Okay, another question from Miss Josephine. Um, looks like the publishers not imposing embargo are all or mostly publishers that publish non-English titles. Uh, the 
publishers that do not introduce an embargo, uh, they are English language publisher and non-English language publisher. So it's a mixture. It's not uh, all non-English uh, publisher. I mean, De Gruyter, uh, we have about 50-50% in terms of our uh, content is in non-English and in English. But there are also uh, the publisher that I've shown earlier. Uh, let me just maybe share my screen. Uh, Right, so here uh, you can see uh, academic study press, they have English and non-English. Right? Amsterdam University Press uh, is in uh, English. Uh, Detail, it's in uh, non-English. EDP Science, uh, they do publish some English and uh, non-English content. Uh, Gorgeous, uh, it's a theology uh, publisher. They publish a lot of those uh, religion and theology. Uh, this is uh, non-English. Non English, uh, ISIS Institute of Southeast Asia Publishing. Uh, it's all English, right? Uh, it's uh, they are based within uh, NUS and Singapore. Uh, Multilingual Matters. Uh, this is uh, English. So uh, we got quite a lot of uh, actually the uh, titles uh, focus a lot on the linguistic language. So we saw there's also quite a lot of demand in Asia Pacific. Uh, transcript a lot. Uh, there is a mixture of uh, English and non-English. So University of Hawaii is all English. Uh, Vincent Network, uh, it's non-English. So it's a, a good mixture of, uh, I would say, almost like 50-50. Uh, and of course, uh, as I mentioned earlier, all Detroiter content and our imprint, uh, it's not in the embargo. So every month, new titles will still be added on. Okay, um, let's give you another minute for questions to be typed. All right, there we go. Um, so there's a comment um, from Cindy that it's quite disappointing to learn that embargo will be imposed to front list titles, which sort of defeats the purpose of the EBA program. Uh, hi, Cindy. So... Yes, uh, it's kind of uh, disappointing. Like, like I said, we are not the only one. All aggregator, uh, they have this embargo. And we are the last published, we are the last uh, partners of this uh, university presses to introduce this uh, embargo. And again, uh, I, as I mentioned earlier, it's because some of those reasons that I mentioned, they, they think a lot about the sustainability. Without the university press, uh, without the university's funding and the friendly sales, uh, quite often they will find it very difficult to uh, sustain the whole uh, university press operation. So that is why uh, one of their major consideration of uh, introduce, introducing this uh, embargo. So whether it's EBA, even DDA, there's embargo in it. I mean, it's... It's not our decision. Uh, these are all imposed by the university press and partners. We are just, uh, uh, we have to follow their policy. But I want to uh, assure you and also to stress the point about the content, right? In terms of content growth, the amount of content, the value of the content, uh, what, you, what we see. Uh, across uh, the different libraries, the usage of uh, the, the average usages coming from these three copyright years, so-called the front list, typically contributes about 20% uh, of the usage. By and large, 80% of the uh, usage are from the uh, so-called uh, 20... 21 and before, right? So those 2022, 2023 or 2024, the three copyright year, from all the usage data we see on average, 
right? It's between uh, 12 to 25 percent. So on average, it's about 20 percent. It contributes about 20 percent of the usages. So that's that's the reason why we want to also offer a. Uh, there is an alternative uh, way of uh, acquiring the front list content. Uh, it's through this collections uh, purchase or by subject or single title purchase through Gobi. So there is still an avenue of uh, procuring the uh, the front list titles. And in order for, for us to uh, adjust this uh, change, we have also uh, kind of like uh, introduced this uh, new revised uh, pricing and discount, right? So with that, uh, hopefully, because with the adjustment or the prices, you can still uh, be able to purchase through the uh, single title option. Uh, questions uh, from uh, Belinda. So I find it quite curious that universities are restricting, the university presses are restricting content for other university. It actually uh, flies in the face of the whole scholarly sharing philosophy between universities. Uh, but there's a, a big like a open access uh, movement, but at the same time, quite a large part of content are behind paywall. Uh, I, I can understand that uh, between the uh, academicians, uh, the scholarly community, uh, they want to uh, kind of disseminate the, the knowledge, the research more widely. But at the same time, there is still a uh, consideration on the uh, sustainability, right? So in order to uh, either sustain if you look at the uh, the pricing of the uh, university press, typically their price are much, much lower than comparing to the commercial publisher, right? So as I mentioned, those uh, scholarly uh, content, typically uh, the global uh, sales, their book, their content being acquired by uh, libraries, on average is about 100 copies or 100 institutions will purchase up to uh, 200 at best nowadays, right? So with that sales volume uh, going down, it makes the uh, viability, the sustainability of some of these uh, university press even much more difficult, right? So that's, that's one of the uh, consideration in, in terms of this uh, embargo. So uh, I hope, uh, I mean, if you are, if we take, the position of the uh, university press, we can also understand their fear, their anxiety, their concern in terms of uh, ensuring the uh, the viability to continue uh, in the scholarly uh, dissemination of knowledge. So there is still a large part of those operations uh, costs that they need to uh, continue. Okay. A question from Monica. Uh, may I know if the list of publishers involved in embargo included in the PowerPoint is the completed list? If not, uh, where can they get the um, list of all the involved press? So uh, these are the, what I've shown on the slides are the publishers that are involved in the uh, embargo. So as it is now, uh, this is the one that we have uh, finalized everything. Right. We don't expect any more uh, to be added on, right? But again, uh, they may change their decision. Uh, maybe along, along the way, they may get out of the embargo. We are trying to collect more statistics to, to show the uh, university press and the publisher that uh, how, uh, how to help them to, uh, to increase, uh, to spread the... Uh, their content more widely, right? So whether they will remove embargo or other press will join the embargo, uh, we can't be certain uh, down the road. But as it, it, as it is now, uh, what I've shown on the uh, 
the slides, these are the list of publisher uh, that has embargo. Yeah. So it's uh, the complete list. In my previous uh, uh, presentation, I've shown like, uh, I probably will uh, add on that particular slide before Lavinia share with everyone who attended this session or who have resisted but not able to join us. Uh, I've shown like uh, the content across a comparison with uh, Muse, JSTOR, uh, and OPSO, right? The content that is available on the aggregator, we will have it. But whatever content we may have it may not be available through whether it's a JSTOR uh, or uh, Project Muse or UPSO, right? So in terms of the university press uh, content, uh, De Kreuter has one of the most comprehensive coverage now. And we do have also six university press that has a exclusive backlist uh, with De Kreuter. There are about 9,000 titles like uh, from Columbia, from Harvard, you know, from Stanford, Right, so there's a list of uh, six university press. We can share uh, that with you, about 9,000 titles that we have uh, exclusivity. Again, these are backlist, not the front list, but backlist typically contribute about between 60 to 80% of the usages that we see uh, in the, the EBA program. Right. So the half-life of uh, particularly uh, on our EBA, about 70% of our content are humanity social sciences. 30% are the STM related, right? So these humanity social sciences uh, tends to have a longer half-life. And that's the reason why the usages are typically uh, very healthy, right? For those uh, back, back lists. And more important, we also uh, seen some research uh, saying that uh, books citation typically start to uh, increase uh, after about 18 months, right? So that's where the, use, uh, the usage and the uh, citation start to, uh, uh, to increase. So unlike journal articles, it's much faster. But for books, their citation typically will be about 18 months later, they will start to see increase in uh, citation and reference. Okay, I don't see any questions posted. So I think we can wrap up this set. Oh, okay. So we have one from Cindy. Uh, so we will send um, the, the list of university presses which will impose embargo policies from next year onwards after the meeting, as well as the slides that Stephen has presented. Uh, yep. We will share it in the email uh, format with everyone here. And we will upload the uh, latest uh, title list onto a FTP site for you to download. It's quite a large file, about 20 megabytes, so I don't want to clot your email. So we will upload to a FTP for you to download the full title list uh, so that you know uh, all the publishers in our EBA program and up to which copyright year the contents are available uh, beginning of 2024. So as I said again, 2024, uh, the, the copyright year that our embargo is 2022, 2023, 2024, right? So for those publishers that involve in embargo, you have up to 2021. And 2025, you have 2022 content added on, right? So uh, we'll provide you a, a list of all those titles uh, up to date, up to uh, end of June uh, this year. So we run this title list uh, in our EBA on a quarterly basis but titles are uploaded onto EBA on a monthly basis and uh, all the metadata uh, information, it's also updated to the discovery, the major discovery services on a monthly basis, right? Okay, so um, don't think there's any more questions coming through. 
But if there but is, do write us an email. So uh, send an email to uh, Lavinia, and we will address any of those uh, questions that you may think of uh, after this uh, session, mm -hmm. right? Uh, if there's no further questions, uh, thank you very much uh, for this morning and uh, appreciate your uh, understanding on uh, this embargo uh, on our position. We are taking instruction from our partners and the university press, but uh, I hope uh, you, you could uh, understand the situation that the university press have, uh, their concern that they think about. And we'll try our best to uh, address any of the questions that you may have and provide you any uh, support information listing uh, as much uh, as we can. Not a problem at all. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you.